things I want to show you is going, one of the great pleasures I have is when I was on the TV and the travel. And we got to see some great places like in Italy here, for example. It didn't matter what color fly you fish, but in Italy with those glacial runoff streams, it was essential that you had a bead with a fluorescent pink. That was just absolutely essential. This is Anthony Naranja, who's the captain of the team, currently captain of the team. We're fishing the upper Rienza here. This is up around the Dolomite region in northern Italy. The stream is cold. We had late runoff, so the water was already cold. And this went into a tailwater, and that dumped colder water. So these water temperatures were about 35, 36 degrees. Just cold, cold, crystal clear water. So Anthony ended up going to a purely monofilament system because the tapes were so soft. He just felt that the mono game was a little more effective. And this is what the poles do quite a bit. In these soft, soft takes, they go to an all-mono system. Now, the cool thing about this, when you, you can spot fish in these clear waters, and this is what I was hearing Tim talk about, just kind of like an enticing technique with streamers. But what you're going to do, when you can spot a fish under a brush, but you can't drift to it, you cast, hold the rod tip upstream, just let that nip just move downstream, right in front of the fish, and then suddenly you just start jigging it right in front of its face, pulling it away, moving it back. Basically, you get to the point where it gets pissed off or it wants to eat or it gets aggravated and it wants to go away. But we would just spot these fish in these little pockets, cast, hold the flies, and basically just jig those flies right in front of their face. With the competition scene, there's a lot more competition jig style hooks. They actually have a couple over here in the Umpa model. But with the jig style hook, you can actually dead drift it, but also you can, especially during hatches or when you want to give the the, your nip a little motion, those jig style flies are just really cool and very effective in the right given conditions. And the techniques proved well. Anthony ended up with seven fish, ended up third in his session. The other part I want to make is this. Think about playing big fish in big water. The biggest mistake most anglers want to do is they want to go, go part of the field with hutch here, go in that orbis pose. They want to elevate that rod to bring that fish up to the surface. When you're fishing big water like this, the last thing you want to do is bring the fish up to the surface. You want to keep the fish down low because the currents are softer there. As soon as you bring that fish up to the current, you're not only fighting the fish, but you're also fighting those stronger currents. So keep the rod tip down low and off to the side. And when the fish is finally spent, then you can go into the Orvis pose, and then you can bring the fish in. But just so often we want to just, now I don't care, you can golf or do whatever, but if you don't like to look at this grayling, you need to pick up golf or do something else, because get, get the hell out of here. <laughs> One gorgeous grayling. And remember, as soon as you bring that rod tip up to the surface, you're going to encourage the fish to jump around and splash. And that's where you're going to get tangles. So really do everything you can, like in saltwater fishing, when you're playing the fish, Keep the rod tip down low and off the side for the most part. This is just a shot of lance, just reiterating what we were talking about. Cast it and not dragging your flies, just fishing very, very little weight. Cast it and just following the rod tip and just watching that leader just dance up and down the current. This was the Azarco River, another cool river uh, up in that area. And this actually had a very healthy population, what they call marble trout, which looks kind of like a bull trout, just kind of a, a bland looking fish, Lar usually larger carnivorous fish. But in the, in the pockets, we found some smaller fish that would actually eat a nymph. And as black fish, what were we going to say? 24, 25? No, that's about 19 inches. But I know what everyone here would say. It's about 20 inches. <laughs> but gorgeous fish. Absolutely gorgeous fish. A marble trout. They get them in uh, a lot of the parts of the Eastern Europe. Now, sight fishing, suspension system. This is where there's a time and place where you can do tight line techniques where you can only get so close. There's a time and a place where you want to fish from a distance because you can't stay on top of the fish. <coughs> so for example here, we're going to talk about a little bit about the curly cue and regular indicators. This is a place where I live approximately about half a mile downstream. My wife and I actually walk our golden retrievers and our kids up along this section of the stream. There's no one that ever fishes because they call it frog water. You can't catch fish there. Look at the water. Yes, you can because fish are there. And then also what we need to do is develop a system that can cast and deliver flies without spooking fish, but also is sense enough to detect very soft takes using very little weight. We'll talk a little bit about the curlicue. Gorgeous little fish. And, you know, I'm not against it. If you have to use a, a, a bobber or if you have to use a suspension device, I don't care. I'll do whatever it takes to catch fish. <laughs> suspension techniques. My favorite indicators, they have a bobber. Tim showed me a balloon indicator that he likes to use. Dry droppers, whatever it is, just something that can suspend the nymph at a particular large flies for heavy rigs, and then also a little CDC fly that does a good job imitating cast, but also you can skate, but also does a good enough job suspending lightly weighted flies. Suspending your nymphs, I want you to think about things in two ways, two, two scenarios. One is 
most of the time about one times the depth, and then the other is about one and a half times the depth of the water. Is this? Think about hydraulics. You have faster currents on the most of the time. We have faster currents on the surface, slower currents on on the bottom. So what happens in medium currents? You have pull, basically tension. The indicator moves the fly down, moves the indicator downstream while the nip's on the bottom. So what you end up getting most of the time with medium currents is about a 45 degree angle. Here's your drive fly again pushed downstream, and here's your nymph on the bottom. So you, in medium currents you get about a 45 degree angle. And when you measure that out about a 45 degree angle times the depth of the water, it's about one and a half times the depth of the water. So if you want your flies on the bottom in medium currents on the bottom, you usually want to space your indicator about one and a half times the depth of the water. In slower currents where you have uniform currents, same speed on the surface as you do on the bottom, if you have fish enough weights, those flies will literally drop to a true 90 degree angle because there's no surface tension there. So in, current, in water where there's uniform currents, you basically want to fish your flies about one times the depth of the, depth of the water if you want your flies on the bottom. What about faster water? Faster water? We can talk about that, but normally with faster water, I usually don't exceed two times the depth of the water, ever. Normally I still go about one and a half times the depth of the water, but what we end up doing with indicator fishing is doing an overpowered <coughs> method. Basically, it's a technique I, I picked up from the steelhead fishers. So basically, what we're talking about with elevation and lead, what you want to do is create manageable slack. You can do that with a fan of a bobber or an indicator. Basically, if you will, most of the time, most common situations, you're casting upstream. So as soon as you cast upstream, the, the fan of a bobber is downstream, your nymphs are upstream. So what happens, the tension immediately begins to occur. So what you want to do in those situations, and this only works when you have room to give. In short pockets, you're pretty well screwed, but you need to have basically a, a, a section of water where you call it a sacrificial drift to the point where this, you cast upstream, indicator's here, your nymphs are upstream. So what you're gonna do as soon as you make this cast, the indicator lands downstream, what you are simply going to do, and there's tension here, you're gonna make an overpowered mend, keeping the fly on the water, but re simply reposition the indicator upstream, this creates slack, lets the fly drop, indicator goes back over, and then you continue to drift through. And that's what I like to do in faster in, in, in deeper water, in faster currents. I really don't like to exceed two times the depth of the water. There's just too much slack, in my opinion. So that's one of the things I like to do. The other thing I like to do, tying off the bend. Most, this is what I do most of the time. You can tie off the dropper, but most of the time I tie it directly off the bend. It's a little cleaner, and I think you get far less tangles. This is something, again, you'll learn something new every day. I'm sure most of you have already done this, but this is a technique that I learned from tying off the bend. It's very easy. Just take your tip and off the spool. Here's your nymph that you want to tie onto, but you take your tip and off the spool. And what you're going to do is create a loop five, six, seven times. <coughs> create your tag. <coughs> go through your tag. Create your loop. Here's your <coughs> hook. And there you go. Just a, a real simple way of tying off the bend. Quick and easy. There's other ways of doing it, but that's the, one of the quickest ways to know of tying off the bend. Page 32 in the book, don't forget, okay? <laughs> Do you like one way better than the other? Off the bend? Or the I tie bend? off the bend where if I, if I want to fish basically heavy, fly, heavy flies on the bottom all the time, or if I don't, there's not much of a hatch and those fish are on the bottom, I usually tie right off the bend. But if there's a hatch and I want to have a little more action or fish some lightly weighted flies, that's where I will tie off the drop. That's all this technique is, just tying up, a little, creating a little loop in your hand. It's basic, all it is is it's a clinch knot. You're tying a clinch knot in your hand, and then just put it around the bend of the hook, hold on to the tight to the tag, and going right to work. Nice and easy way of tying off the bend. Okay. And then tying your next one. Very simple. Now suspension tools, this is one of my favorite things I love to do, the curly cue. I like to fish the curly cue. This is, I've done a lot, I've done some saltwater fishing, this is one of my favorite sites. Watch for this curly. Watch for that thing to hesitate to get pulled upstream. You strip right there, see that? Boom. And of course you missed the damn fish, but that's beside the point. <laughs> but the reason why I like the curlies, larger curlies, they sit higher off the water, and, and I like them spaced apart, because you can see them contradict, they can move back and forth. That's one system. The other system is just using the Thama bobber, and I use the same leader formula, that nine and a half foot leader formula. I throw a Thama bobber right on the tip section of that cider material. People complain about the Thama bobber is this. The biggest thing about the Thama bobber, they say, well, it's difficult to track. And I can see that if you're looking at solely the Thama bobber, because they have indicators of the colors that can turn and twist, and it can 
will give you an indication as to where your flies are in relation to your, <coughs> into your in relation to your cider. The, the thing I like to do with this system, I like to leave about five to six inches of cider material between my my thamma bobber and my leader. And what this does is when it's on the water, that cider material will actually angle to the direction where the flies are. So basically what I'm saying is if that cider material is angled upstream, that means tension is occurring. If I see that cider material angled down across or across stream from that thamma bobber, it's telling me that my nymphs are in a different current, and therefore probably most likely out of control of my drift. So I use that thamma bobber, but I use that piece of colored monofilament on the water and look at the direction that that colored monofilament is in. That's telling me exactly where my flies are placed or aligned in relation to where my indicator is. So George, in that picture there, mm -hmm. in your left hand, that's the line side? That's or? my left hand, that's actually my tippet side. Tippet side. Yes. Okay. Yep, exactly. Good question. And that's it, just an easier way to track things. You can basically high stick nymphing with the suspension system. The thing I hate the most about traditional indicator fishing is that menu. The, the key word behind many, if you look up in the dictionary, is to make a correction to a, a mistake. And with this system right here, I try to do everything I can to suspend nymphs from its indicator, but I try not to keep much line leader on the water. I try to keep as much line leader off the water as possible. Just a simple little system. For example, here in faster water like this, it's deep water. I can't get downstream. So what my main primary quarry is, is downstreaming. That's where most of the fish are in this pocket. I just know it by heart. So the problem is if I, I can't get positioned downstream, I want my drift to go downstream of me. And with tight line nymphing, I just can't control the drift once it's below me. Slack is accumulating and I just can't sense a take. So this is the perfect time where if I want my drift to go downstream of me when I'm tight line nymphing, I just simply put on a thema bobber right at the edge of my cider, cast far enough upstream to allow the fly to get to the bottom, and then basically just reposition the rod tip and then just drop the rod tip to let it feed down to the bottom. This is a great way to actually teach you. Also, that combination of that cider and the, or the, the, the cider and also the indicator, if you want to learn how to lead your flies at the correct depth, especially when tight line nymphing, what you're doing is basically this. You can see the indicator. This guy that was doing this, I was doing a lesson with, he wasn't leading his flies fast enough. You can see how that cider is directly across. What you want to do is speed up your retrieve a little bit, move that cider material directly downstream and create a little bit of that bow. Once that cider material is downstream of your indicator, that is telling you that you're in control and you're leading the flies to the correct depth. Otherwise, if that cider's material is directly across from you, it's just telling you that you're not leading the flies fast enough. Now, any type of situation when you have to do men's, which, again, I, I try to avoid, you want to grease. Basically, everything from your indicator all the way up to your fly line. The biggest detriment to any sort of in indicator or mending on the water is a sunken line and leader. So just do a little things and grease it up. Once you, and of course, degrease your hands. The key to mending is creating a little bit of slack. So what we're going to do is we're going to cast far enough upstream. And this is the perfect situation. It's difficult to tight line them here. You have currents pulling you in a different direction across current. So what we're going to do is make a cast upstream, make a little bit of a mend upstream. I'm in Lock Haven right now. Or, and Lamar is about four or five miles downstream. I could actually mend and make a drift all the way down to Lamar if I wanted to, but I don't need to. This is the great thing about suspension tools. You get such a long, long drift. Some of my good friends in Arkansas that fish some of the famed waters, they'll cast 40, 50 feet upstream, make men's, let the fly go another 40, 50 feet downstream. So basically you're getting a 100 foot drift with one cast. As with tight line nymph, and you're restricted to a very short drift. And this is important, especially when you can't get in the position. I'm gonna leave you with this. One of my favorite things in the world to do is this. It rains in central Pennsylvania. We had a rainy year last, lots of streams that flood. Luckily for us, we have a lot of spring creeks. We have a lot of flood plains. So what happens is this. These fish, when it, when it floods, will actually come up under the grass, like carp or bonefish, and they'll start tailing right in the grass. And what we'll do is we'll walk up along the banks and start sight fishing. And we'll fish lightly weighted, on my way of sand wallworms, and we'll smack the fly right behind the fish. And the fly is so lightly weighted that as the fish turns and looks at the fly, the fly is so lightly weighted it usually drops in front of its face at that point. Now what my wife did, she made a mistake. She, the biggest problem is getting excited. You can see the fish take. I don't make mistakes, so when I want to show mistakes, I have to bring my wife in the picture for a few seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we go back. She's not here, is she? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, she made a mistake. She actually caught a few more fish than I did. But this is just one of those cool little things. If you ever go to central Pennsylvania or you have flood conditions, not all is lost. The moral of the story is this. Surround yourself with great people. And like, 
you don't have to be concerned. If Bobby Knight doesn't call himself a <laughs> sissy for not using the Thama bobber, neither should you. Kevin and his wife were fishing the, the hell out of Thama bobbers last year in the Roaring Fork. He loved it. So don't worry about that. Just change and adapt, because again, I will do whatever it takes to catch gorgeous, gorgeous fish like this. It doesn't matter if you're tight line nipping or suspension system. Just do whatever it takes to be dynamic. Always seek the best techniques, going from New Zealand all the way to taking your kids along the local park. So thank you very much.